because I believe that if I can help someone get closer to their goal, that's what a sale is for me. I'm helping someone get to their goal faster because they're using some of, of my advice. I want to sell as much as I possibly can because the more I sell, the more I'm just helping people. Thank you for joining us on the Evolve Your Brand Podcast. I am your host, Olean Merkies. And as always, a huge, huge shout out to Icon Industries, Shane times three, because you need to hear your name all the time. Steven, love you, bro. I appreciate you. I know I'm going to say something embarrassing. You're going to put it on as an intro to David, but that's not cool. And without further ado, I want to introduce our guest, David J. Miller from Ocean's View Financial. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much. So you're going to drop some wealth knowledge on us today, right? Well, I mean, we'll see. We'll see where this goes. Really? I'm up for it. Oh, we're going. <laughs> we're going someplace and you're taking us there. Let's do it. Let, let's start with you. Like, where does your story begin? Um, And how did you end up in San Diego? Let's jump into that. Okay. So I'll do the the Cliff's Notes version. But um, so I... Uh, grew up in Los Angeles and realized I want to get out of Los Angeles pretty much as quickly as possible. Nice. Um, Love him. I'm a big surfer. So uh, when I was looking at colleges, I, I only wanted to go to a college by good surf. So it was either Santa Barbara or San Diego. And I got in San Diego. So I came here and um, I thought I was always going to be a doctor. Okay. But then I realized that I was financing my whole education with student loans and I was going to be probably half a million dollars in debt by the time I even finished medical school. And I might not even know if I wanted to be a doctor um, at that point. And I'd be 33 years old and almost be like a slave to all this uh, student loans. So I changed gears. I sort of just tried to get through school as quickly as possible. And then I realized I needed to make a higher level of income than I'd be able to make as an employee. So I, did, I really wanted to start my own business. I figured I have to be self-employed in order to pay off my student loans. And so um, in a roundabout way of wanting to start my own business, I worked in banking for a few years before the banking crisis. And then um, I started my my wealth management business about 16 years ago. Um. Let, let's jump into like how you grew up and stuff. What what school did you go to? I went to UC San Diego. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. And uh, in LA, where did you live in LA? I lived in Covina. In Covina. The Eastern Inland Empire. Okay. And how much has that area changed? Still got uh, family back there? I don't have family there. You so don't? I don't really go back there too much. Actually. <laughs> You're like, I'm in and my family's here. Yeah. Uh, you got kids, wife. I'm married and I have two kids. I have a five and a five-year-old son and a one-year-old little daughter. Nice. Yeah. Congrats, man. Thank you. You're you're in the thick of it. Oh, it's busy. Enjoy yeah. every minute. Thank you. David, they grew up fast. Do you have kids? Three. Okay. Fast. They grew up too fast. I believe it. Five and one. What's the best part about being a dad? Best part about being a dad is when my my kids look up at me and smile and uh just the love I get from them and and the uh it's just it's special. Any 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 parent knows, but uh it's so fulfilling. It's my favorite part of my day is getting home and playing with my kids. Nice. Um, how long have you been married? For 10 years. Happy? Happy happily married. What's the what what's the best part about being married? Uh best part about being married is I think having a a great best friend that's also has my back that I have fun with and I get to go have adventures with and then I can be romantic with and share this adventure of parenting and uh, just have a partner that I can share this life with is really my favorite part. Is it amazing? It is. I mean, I'm jealous. I'm, I don't have that, but it sounds it's, wonderful. It's not all it's roses. Not <laughs> it's not all roses. It's got its tough parts. Right. Um, but when it's good, it, it's nice. That's incredible. Well, good. I mean, it, it's uh, we all we all have our purpose in life. So, what <clears throat> do you guys surf together? She's not a surfer. And some of my friends said <laughs> I will only date or get married to a surfer. Right. And the problem with that is I like to surf big waves or maybe kind of more but some people might call more dangerous waves. Ooh, and, okay. Uh, I wouldn't be able to, if my wife surfed, we'd have to go to the 
the easy surf spots for her. So I can I say, I'm going to go do my thing. And we have other things we like to do together, but, uh, but she has her hobbies. She plays tennis and likes to do her thing. Um, and then I go do my thing. It's great. There you go. I like it. So basically the surfing solo is all about just the risk. What do you love about the dangerous surfing? Um, what I love about it is it just makes me totally in the present moment. Mm. So if I'm in a big wave situation, it just forces me to be kind of in the flow. I can't be thinking about anything else. I can't be thinking about what I'm going to do tomorrow or what happened mm. yesterday. I'm purely in the present moment. And there's life, really beautiful life lessons I've gotten from it. Like if I, if I f fall on a big wave, it's so powerful that I can't, if I try to fight it, it won't do anything because the wave's just going to hold me down. So I have to learn to just let go and surrender to it. And if I let go and just relax, then I can serve up my air and I don't run out of air. And then I'll just pop up after 10 or 15 seconds and I'll be fine. But if I try to fight it, struggle, 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 then I'll burn through my air. I might start to panic and something bad could happen. So it's just a good lesson to be able to let go and, and surrender to whatever's happening. There was so much gold in that. Like, I don't even know where to begin. I think you just changed the life talking about serving. <laughs> like, I'm like, oh, okay. So that's what makes you hard. I don't know about that. I like doing it. it, yeah. it mentally, it's been really good for me. Yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, it's like, uh, I talked to my kid, uh, my boys about like, hey, in order to get hard, you have to do hard things consistently. Yes. And I would say most people aren't going to take the life risk because you have a have a le different level of focus. So I it's beautiful that. the way you said that. Well, I heard, and I heard someone say to, to live an exceptional life, you have to do exceptional things. So it's, uh, it, yeah. I, I do, believe do you think that stuff. holds true for you? Yeah. How so? Well, Give me an example. I, th I think that you, if you want to have a life that's different from the average person, you have to be willing to do things that are different than what the average person would be willing to do. So in business, that would be maybe making more reach outs to people than people, most people would feel comfortable. Maybe most people would not feel comfortable reaching out to anybody that yeah. they don't know and approaching them about business. But if for, in my experience, um, I just got, got to look at those things. Like every time someone said no to me, they weren't saying no to me. They were saying no to what I was offering them. So I didn't take it personally. And if I could get through more no's, I was going to get more yeses from right. people. So it's, I, I think that applies to what, what you were saying. Definitely. I mean, I think in sales, um, sale, for some people, sales has a negative connotation to it. Mm -hmm. And I think in my opinion, sales has sometimes become manipulation. Yes. And so what are your thoughts about how you sell and you, I think you mentioned that you were growing your team. Mm -hmm. So how do you approach that? So sales doesn't become manipulation, manipulation. It comes value creation and problem solving. Yeah. Well, with, without, I don't, I'm not the type of person that likes to wear my faith on my sleeve or anything like that, but I do believe that there's a higher power in this world, uh, more, more than any of us. And I believe that how I can serve that higher power is by acting in integrity with who I am and acting in integrity with other, other people's best interests. And I know I've seen this, that when I turn away business, if it's not a good fit, or if I know maybe, oh, I could sort of push something and maybe the person would agree to it because we have a good relationship, but it's not really in their best interest. I, ne I just never do it because for me, any level of income that I might get, it's not going to be worth the feeling of looking at myself in the mirror and saying, well, yeah, but what did I have to do to get this money? I'd rather have less money, but be able to, and it's not the, it's not the way it works. You have more money, you know, when you, when I found, when I act out of integrity and I feel better, I, I, I feel good. And I think it's, Life and business is all about energy. And the more energy, <laughs> so the more and the better energy I have, the better I feel about myself. People can feel that. And they've done studies. I'm sure you're aware that people can feel mm -hmm. your energy from like across the room. And so if I feel good about myself, I feel high energy, I'm in integrity, that's going to be more attractive to other people to want to work with me. So that's the way I've always approached it. And, and I, I think it's played out in my life. It's a great way to live life.
Do I think do so. right. Yeah. Do right for the sake of doing right. Yes. And it's and there's a business case for it too because uh, let's say that somebody comes to me and I say, hey you're not a good fit for this strategy, for example, or I think you're better off just staying where you're at. You shouldn't do anything with me. Just keep doing what you're doing. It's actually really good. Well, that person, it's different. What I told, that's not what they're expecting to hear. They probably expected me to try to convince them to do something. And so maybe they're going to go tell their friend about me and maybe their, or their uncle or their dad, they'll say, Hey, I had this great conversation. And then I've had that happen where I get those referrals, even though I didn't sell this person, I, I serve them the right way. And then I've had it come back to me in, in totally different ways. David, you're my kind of people. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. I, uh, you, you did the mortgage advisor, uh, back in 2008. Yeah. And, uh, what's interesting to me is I believe in change in my industry. I mm-hmm. really do. Uh, we, in the finance space, we have powerful tools at our disposal mm-hmm. that we could deploy to change people's lives. How do you, how do you do that for the families and all the people that you serve? How is it that you're changing your lives and making an impact on the community? Yeah. So my approach is it's really all about the person that I'm talking to and, and about their goals. So what is a little bit different about my approach is I just want to know what they want to accomplish. And I want to know where they want to go. And then once I understand that at a really deep level, only then would I jump in and say, hey, here are some tools and strategies that might be able to help you get there faster. Right. And that's always been my approach. I'm always looking to add value, even in ways maybe where I don't get compensated. Um, if there's someone has a high interest rate on their mortgage or the, or they want need to refinance their mortgage, then I want to connect them to somebody. Or if someone needs a new CPA, I'm going to connect them. So I believe in looking at someone's whole financial picture, not just what might generate revenue for me. I love you. <laughs> like seriously. Love you too. Because you're, you're, okay. See, that to me is exponential value that you give people because you're not looking at, hey, I'm a wealth advisor. I'm just going to stay in the zone. I'm not leaving it. Mm Mm-hmm you're actually bringing exponential value to help make people's lives easier. Where did you come up with this business philosophy? Like, where did you pick that up from? Yeah, it's a good question. I've worked with coaches. I've always been, I've always believed in investing in myself. Okay. So um, I've, I invest a lot in professional coaches for myself, for my team. And that's, I just, I love uh, a coach I'm working with now, Jason Hartnoff. He's phenomenal. I'll give him a shout out. But Please. he, um, his idea is that sales is service. And he's taught some really powerful um, ideas to me, which are which could be manipulative if they were used in the wrong way. But if they're used in integrity, then they're, they're powerful. Because I believe that if I can help someone get closer to their goal, that's what a sale is for me. I'm helping someone get to their goal faster because they're using some of, of my advice. Um, and I'm from that, I want to sell as much as I possibly can because the more I sell, the more I'm just helping people. Yeah. Because sales, you have a, you have a different attachment to the word sales, which is service. Yes. And Jason's brilliant. I agree with that. I think that's the best summary of like, Sales of service. I'm like, exactly. That's what it is. I'm not here to sell you. I'm here to service, you know, and uh, I don't know if you follow Alex Hermosi. I'm not familiar with him. You will love him. Okay. So uh, really, really influential guy. And what he says is this. To me, the way I look at sales is I'm here to get to know people, understand what, what they value and what their goals are, and then guide them to a decision that's right for them. Beautiful. I love that. Right? I agree completely. Yeah. Okay. What do you agree about that? Because you went like this before I even finished. What hit home for you on that? It's it's understanding someone's goals. And it's not about Alex's goals. It's about the person that he's sitting in front of, their goals. Um, and so I think if it's done, if so, if it's done that way, it's just a beautiful thing. And and then like how he said, guiding them yeah. to the steps to get them to their to their goals. So I think the world would be a much better place if more people approached uh, their businesses that way. And David, it really starts with, you know, people like yourself and I, which is doing right for the sake of doing right. And the way I look at it for my kids, 
is I want them because they listen to me all the time. It's crazy. You know, I'm on the phone where we, you know, I work remotely yeah. sometimes and they listen to you. I'm like, what if I was a, a sales guy that was manipulating? That's what I'd be teaching mm-hmm. my kids. Like, hey, let's go through a world. And just instead of serving people, you just basically, everything is transactional. It's all about money. Everything is about money. And money to me is a tool. To get done and make an impact on this world, whatever that might, you know, whatever you define that as. So, mm-hmm. how would you, what does money mean to you? I was, th- I'm, uh, was just thinking this where you were going with that. I love that money is energy to mm-hmm. me, and it's there's unlimited money that's out there. I mean, if you look at someone like Elon Musk, you know, he f- he created two hundred billion dollars of money in a few years, really, with his company, his multiple companies. Yeah. So uh, my belief is that there's unlimited money that's out there. <clears throat> and it there's certain, I'm, I'm not an expert. Uh, I've learned some things I, you know, have more to learn here. But some things that I love about what my coach has taught me um, is that when there's value delivered, um, my, my belief is if I deliver value, I'm going to get money one way or another. It might not be from the person I'm sitting with, but it's almost like it creates in the universe, it creates a magnet um, and that magnet's going to pull money to me. I, I may have no idea where it came from, but the more value I can add, the more blessings and abundance are going to come into my life. The recip- uh, reciprocity value. Yes. 100%. Mm-hmm. So are you, uh, are, are you a fan of like, uh, spiritualism, meditation, do you journal? Like what, what habit, what life habits do you embrace every single day that give you the clarity that you have? Yeah. So I, I am a bit, I love meditation. Um, I pray, I love med- I, my morning routine. My, my daughter's been waking up at like six times <laughs> during the night. So it's kind of thrown off, but it'll, It'll come back uh, as she gets her situation figured out. It's short term. Um, but I, my ideal morning is I like to wake up at like 4 or 4.30 in the morning. Um, I, medita- I like to meditate for an hour. And then I like I journal. Um, I have a gratitude practice. So I'll, I'll find five things that I'm really grateful for in my life and really feel that gratitude. And then I'll pick my three things for the day that I want to really want to get done. Whatever else happens, my I call it my three to win for that day. <clears throat> um, and then I actually have a, a little mind movie that I watch. So I created, it's a Joe Dispenza thing, if you've ever heard of him. I, he's powerful. Yeah, yeah. You know, So he's, I've never done one of his uh, courses, which I want to, but um, so the mind movie is pictures that that represent what I want my life to be like, what feelings I want to have, what experiences I want to have. And then it's set to music. So it's about two minutes, but I watch this. It's it's adventures. I want to go place I want to travel, the house I want to live in, my family. And it makes me feel like a million bucks. Uh, brings my energy up really high after I watch that. Thank you so much. I'm going to steal that. Mm-hmm. that it's was, powerful. That was, that's insane. That That's beautiful. <laughs> Like, seriously, I think it's, uh, we had a guest on earlier and he was talking about manifestation and he's like, when I speak to myself and I'm verbalizing all these things out loud, I already possess them. I already have them. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of time. And that goes a long way. So to hear you saying those types of things, I already know how successful you are in your industry and your space because you live it every day. And it begins at four thirty in the morning. That's beast mode right there. What what uh what prompted you to wake up at between four and four thirty? Besides your newborn, <laughs> right? Did you like how? <laughs> Correct. Great. Great. You're exactly right. As someone who knows, um, so uh, it's just really it's a priority for me. So mm-hmm. I figure if I don't if I don't do it first thing in the morning, it's just not going to happen. So I I believe that I want to get the most important things done early in the morning. And I feel like I won my day by, by the time seven o'clock comes around, I've already worked out. I've, I've meditated, I've visualized, I've done my, my gratitude journal. And I, there's really no, I feel like my day is a success already. And then by this, I heard one of my coaches said, as the morning goes, the day flows. 
So um, if the morning starts off good, then generally the rest of the day is going to be good too. You know, I, I don't know how you feel, but it's like those mornings where uh, I sleep through the alarm clock and that happens, I just feel guilty. You know, I'm like, man, I because if you don't take care of, this is what I've learned. It's like, I don't take care of myself and get my mental clarity, especially as a man. It's like, dude, how am I going to step up for other people mm -hmm. when I didn't even invest that time in myself? Yes. It's crazy. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I've been there for sure, of course, you know, and you wake up and then it's like the first feeling is guilt in the day. And that's not necessary versus when I can hit, when I don't hit the snooze and I get up, the first feeling is like, fuck yeah, let's go. Yeah, oh, it is fuck yeah. <laughs> so uh, I feel good. I'm winning. Um, I'm overcoming that weaker version of myself and I'm becoming the person that I want to be. That's incredible. You know, and you say weaker version of yourself and it's not a bad, you know, the, the way I, I talk to myself like that too. That's why I, I, I connected with it. I'm like, how can I expect my sons to be hard and to do hard things if I don't show them consistently that their father is doing that? Yes. You know? So I think that that's like the grounding for me, which is they're watching everything. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. It's crazy how kids watch everything. Hmm. Unbelievable. I'm just starting to see that with my five-year-old now, but yeah, I'm sure I'll notice it way more Very as well. they <laughs> those are Those are amazing. As they grow up, you enjoy every moment. What, um, legacy-wise with your with, with your family, like what, what's your ultimate goal for your family? You, what do you want to accomplish? Yeah, I mean, I came from a family that was that was divorced. Uh, my really? family split up, so I grew up with my mom, and they did a great job. I have great relationships with both my parents. Uh, they did their best. I love them dearly. I'm thankful for what they gave me. Um, I want to give a different uh, lifestyle yeah. and and let my kids see that things can be different, and also uh, to learn hard work. Um, patience, discipline, kind of some of these key, that would be my legacy, that they're kind people. Um, not so much financially. I'm kind of torn on that. I don't know. I, I had nothing yeah. and I'm really, was a, I'm a hard worker. I don't know if I had- Really? You came from nothing? Nothing. Yeah. Really, man? No. I couldn't have, okay. I wouldn't have. So you've earned everything you've achieved in life. Yeah. I mean, my, mo my mom worked two jobs as a cocktail waitress wow. and a legal secretary when I was growing up. So for four nights a week, I wouldn't even see her when I came home from work. My brother would pick me up from school. He'd make me dinner. Um, we lived very lower middle class uh, upbringing. We didn't, I remember my mom balancing her checkbook, buying groceries, like down to the penny to make sure that she could afford the groceries we were buying for that week. So, um, so I'm torn on that because I don't know if I want to, if it would take away their hunger and their drive, maybe it, I don't think it necessarily would, but it's really for them to be good people and yeah. to um, and for them to have a vision of being a, a self realized individual. I love that. That that's you know I'm sitting in this seat. I, I've met such incredible people. I, I sometimes feel guilty because I'm like I'm learning so much. I love this. Uh, it makes a huge difference when you didn't grow up being handed things like mm -hmm. the, the accomplishments that people have achieved by just realizing, Hey, I want different and change begins with change. Mm -hmm. So when was that moment for you where you're like, I'm going to do something different. Do you recall like what, what happened? What triggered all that? I think part of it for me was just growing up and watching, watching my mom in the grocery store <clears throat> and, really? and balancing that. I could just sense the stress that my parents had and my dad God bless him. I love him. Um, he wouldn't pay the child support to my mom. So she was struggling. My dad had his own issues. He was in credit card debt for 30 years of his life. And uh, so I just saw from a young age, the stress that finances cause in people's life. And so I figured, I told myself, I don't remember when it was, but from a young age, I remember thinking, I don't ever want to be under that kind of financial stress in my life. Whatever I have to do, I'm going to do it because the alternative is unacceptable to me to live like they, the, I live under that level of stress was unacceptable for me. So I feel, I knew I, whatever would happen, I was going to do whatever it took to not have that be the case. Congratulations for changing your life. Like that's incredible. Thank you. What a great example. Like, um, 
and, and I think that's the meaning for me now. Now I realize like the impact I make on other people and the financial tools that are at my disposal. It's like, I have an obligation to help people out there, you know, because mm -hmm. I want them to live their best life and working for money is a bad, bad, that's a bad strategy in life. Like you'll always do it. You can never get out of it. Hearing your dad with 30 years of, of debt, like what quality of life is there? Not good. So let, let's dive into what what your why is, mm -hmm. okay? Why did you become a wealth advisor? How come? Yeah, so I have a deep love for people and I want to help people. I couldn't, I could never have been a guy who just like traded stocks or was an investment banker that worked on pitch books for a hundred hours a week and, and didn't actually meet with clients. I knew I had to be belly to belly uh, with people for me to feel really happy because that's what gives me joy. Um, so that- What gives you joy? Being, let's not, with, let's being not, with people. Yeah. What What is it about being with people that brings you joy? It's really, I guess- it's hard to put my finger on. I just feel good. Um, so if I, it, it brings me a good energy. And especially if I can take them from a place of anxiety and uncertainty, and I can give them a pathway out of that to confidence, peace of mind, joy, um, which I, I do with my work. It's what my favorite part about my work is. It's really a problem, solving problems for people. And I'm solving big problems for people. Um, and I love that. I love being able to help t take them through that process. Now, would, I mean, do you have a threshold for like, does someone have to make a certain income to be able to reach out to you? No, I mean, we'd be happy to talk to yeah. whoever. And if I, if I'm not the right fit, I, I do have other people on my team. I can connect people. Amazing. With. Yeah. But generally the more taxes people are paying, the more complex their situation, usually it's business owners. Yep physicians, um, people that are close to retirement that have to figure out how they actually start pulling money out of their portfolio now. That's what we've built. I built my team of six people to really deliver tremendous value to those folks. Well, I am very excited because, uh, you know, as I mentioned, you're one of the first wealth advisors that, that we had on here. And a passion of mine is how do I help my families and the people that I serve get to their goals quicker than what they expected. And what you have to do is have the right team around you to be able to manifest that because we're all experts in our particular field, mm -hmm. you know? And what are your thoughts about what I just said? I couldn't agree more. I think having a team of experts that serve clients is what it's all about. Uh, and I, I think having that collaborative approach is the best way to go. So I, I just think that's 100% the best way to do it. Yeah. So you can already see a relationship being born because like, does your industry, I don't know your industry as well as you do. Does your industry adopt that philosophy? Uh, I think the best, a lot of the best people will do that. People that are, um, maybe they're just mailing it in. Um, they're not really, some people, a lot of advisors get, they get fat and, and happy. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Like yeah. give, give us the in industry scoop because um, real estate, one of the things that has been a turnoff o over the years for me, you know, and you were in the space, it, it it's treated very transactionally. Yes. And I don't grasp that because what we're talking about are huge sums of money, especially in California. California mm -hmm. real estate is different than I would say 90% of the country. So I, I look at it as like I have a fiduciary responsibility to make sure that I deliver on what, what people's goals are. So in my industry, I'm beginning to change. Instead of like, there's enough complaining that happens. So I'm like, I am gonna be the path to change, which is now I promote other mortgage advisors that are working at different companies. That would be like, you're working nor North, uh, Northwestern on your team and then you're having somebody on for Prudential. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. think about the level of confidence that you have to have. Like anybody that's a great more, do you know how come? because there aren't enough fiduciaries out there. Hmm. It's true. I mean, it's, I love that. It's amazing. What, what impact are you going to make on your industry? Like with your team, you said you have a team of six. How long mm -hmm. is it taking you to build that? 
It's been a work in progress. We've really scaled it a lot more in the last three or four years. Congratulations. Thank you. What gave you the desire to actually build a team versus doing it solo? Yeah, so um, I there I had some big growth in one part of my business, which is kind of like the estate planning and the insurance side. And I had a this uh, really breakthrough year of getting serving different clients and and having some different results there. And my coach, so I had kind of a, a little bit of a windfall uh, year. And and my business coach said, you can't spend any of that. You have to invest it back into your business to get more capacity. Because I knew at the time, which was about five years ago, I wasn't able to serve clients in the way that I wanted to. And I knew that they needed without having a few really smart people on my team. So I went out and I took some of that savings and I hired a really smart investment analyst uh, for my team. And then lo and behold, we started attracting much bigger and more complicated accounts. And so the more I've invested into my practice, the better value we're delivering for our clients. And then um, the more comes in. So it's kind of a, it's a balancing act between the the profit margin and making sure that there's enough there. And then at the same time, um, making sure I'm reinvesting, but I've seen my, our revenues gone up by, uh, by 55% um, annually for the past three years since I've been um, investing like 55% this. every yeah. single year for the, that's the compound. Holy smokes. Yeah. yeah. Talk about execution and results. <laughs> you have some great people working with you. It's the team. I mean, it's not me for sure. Yeah. It's, I mean, you could, I hired them, so I had to do that, but they're the ones that are really executing. I just have the ideas, but I can have, I know that they're going to get done in a high level uh, for my clients now. What was the biggest thing that surprised you once you started hiring talented people to meet your standards? I think I always had heard this and talking about the law of manifestation, the law of attraction. Um, but I just told myself when I started hiring these people, I said, I need to go after bigger accounts now because that's who we can service. That's who needs us more. And I was initially intimidated a little bit. Oh, I can't add value. These people are going to be so sophisticated. Um, and I, what do they need me for? And then as I got into, I sort of for, I, I started telling myself, I work with people that have two and $3 million investment accounts. And I told myself that, I told other people that, and all of a sudden, lo and behold, I started seeing these people with two and $3 million investment accounts show up in my office and they had no plans and they, they were in a big mess. And so we started winning these accounts and then uh, it's kind of just this, then we got more referrals and these people are super happy. So yep. they, they it just be, became kind of a snowball. Okay. So close your eyes, think back to that day where that happened and you had the first 2 million, 3 million account. What were you thinking that day? Do you remember? Oh, I mean, I was just so thankful. I was like, oh my God, it works. Like, <laughs> thank you God. Just thank you God. I was so thankful. I really thought it's, which I still believe, I really don't think it's me. I think when there's success that comes, it's not because of me. It's because I'm doing God. I think it's God acting through me and it's God's will acting through me. I'm not, I don't inflate my ego. Uh, it could all go away. I don't, it's, it won't. Um, but it's, it's really more, um, if I can not make it about me, if I can make it about the client's uh, I celebrate for sure. I love to celebrate wins. And uh, I just think that if I can live in, in integrity and do the right thing um, by my by my people, the sky's the limit. It's just yeah. going to keep exploding. I'm a huge David fan. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. This is like, you're the, you're, you're the kind of good guy, quality person that it's easy to advocate for. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I am too. I think I'm a pretty good guy. Well, I'm biased, you, but. you know what I mean? Like, well, you, 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 you've talked a lot about energy, you know, and I think energy is very transparent. Mm -hmm. Doesn't take much. Like you, you can tell when, when someone's being real with you and when someone's just <laughs> yeah, <laughs> saying all the right things. Yes. Very interesting. Uh, where are you? Okay. So how are you changing lives on your team? Like talk about your team a little bit. Like, uh, you're the leader, you're the visionary, mm -hmm. you thank them. What, what makes your team great? 
Yeah, I, I mean, my philosophy is I want to pay better. I want to pay at the top of the quartile for what other people in my industry pay because I don't ever want somebody to leave my team because of pay. Uh, it's so expensive. I learned this the hard way because when I first started, I tried to hire the cheapest person. And I found, and I did that. And then How'd you, that get, go? you get what you pay for. <laughs> it was so, it was expensive. What I learned is it's expensive to be cheap. That's what one of my friends says. And uh, I had turnover. And the most pain, expensive, expensive thing as a business owner is that turnover. Yeah. So I figured, well, if I, if I pay somebody an extra 10 or $20,000 a year, I don't have to pay that all at once. That's like 400 bucks every two weeks. And um, I'm going to get a better person who's going to give me more capabilities and productivity. And then they're probably not going to want to leave either. So I'm giving them uh, a career path. I'm still working on this, but I have a career path for everybody on my team so that they can see where they want to get to and they can understand what steps they would need to take. So everybody's excited um, about where, where they can go in my firm as we continue growing. How come you came up with the everyone having their career path, their goals? Is that common in your industry? No, it's not common. It's not. It's actually yeah. not common to even have a team. Most advisors, the average financial advisor, is a fifty-seven-year-old white heterosexual male with one assistant who's going to retire in three years. Awesome. That's going to do really well in the next 10 years, by the way. I just wanted <laughs> right. you to know that. Correct. And As he's laughing, he's like, yeah, buddy, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good luck. I mean, we're winning accounts from those people of course because you are. they don't have a succession plan and they're not able to deliver this service. So um, I realized that if I can have a great team, that's a differentiator in and of itself in my industry uh, because- a team can do, what's the saying? If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with other people. I if you want, that. okay, let's go. I haven't heard this an one. African, so you got an me. African yeah. Problem. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. <laughs> let's go far. We'll all go far <laughs> together. Um, you don't know this and I hadn't shared it with you. I, I want to get to know people. Uh, we do not have a wealth advisor that's going to consistently come here and give us an update in regards to what's happening, what should people be aware of. Mm -hmm. So I would love for us after the podcast is done, if it makes sense for you, let's chat. Yeah. Because I think, you know, having having someone like yourself, you know, really educating about money is pivotal. You know, uh, I, I hear a lot of families and it does make my heart sad. So- uh, they're like the game is rigged, and I'm never gonna win. And you could you could feel the defeat. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You yes. could feel the defeat. And I know exactly. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I've heard that. Money is a very very personal, touchy subject for a lot of people. How come, from your 16 years of experience, do you think that is? Well, it's we've all heard those stories of everybody's got a, a family member or a friend or they know of somebody who lost all their money by making a bad investment. And that's terrifying. And I can certainly relate to that. I mean, there's Bernie Madoff. He he lost 60 or whatever billion dollars of his client's money. And there's probably people right now that are doing a Bernie Madoff. They just haven't come out in the news yet. So it hasn't been found out. So there are charlatans out there and it's this is these are people's life savings that we're talking about uh, yeah. kind of like you said when you're dealing with their real estate that's their biggest asset and it's it's critically important for them so i'm very empathetic to the fact that people are nervous it's scary i i'm 100% um can feel that and respect it so what what problem like I'm sitting here watching this thinking hey you know I it, it's hard to trust someone with with my with my finances mm -hmm. you know because it's very personal w what problems do you guys go out of your way to solve for people when yeah. it comes to the wealth management at the end of the day our clients are really looking for a few questions answered from yeah. us so one question is am I going to have enough at the end of the day am I on tr either am I on track or could I stop right now? That's a common question I get from people. Another question is, are my kids going to be okay? Is my is my family going to be okay? How much 
is going to be there for my kids when I'm gone? And how, what can we do to optimize that? And then the third area is how can I be as tax efficient as possible? Especially in California, we have a, we have clients that are giving up over half their income to taxes. It's unbelievable. Um, that that's where I really uh, I want to problem solve for self employment, self employment yeah. and entrepreneurship at as an all time high, mm-hmm. and it's very glorified on social media, which I don't agree with because actually I work more now for myself than I ever did for a corporation. Mm-hmm. So for me, it's like. What I've learned about money, and I would love for you to comment about this, I didn't realize that if you don't have the right advisors in your corner, you're going to lose the game and you're going to lose really, really bad. You'll never, ever ever get out of the cycle that starts in school. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah. I mean, there are, there's some tendencies that an advisor can fix and there's some things that an advisor can't fix. The key fundamental would be living b- below their means. If someone can't do that, there's no advisor that's going to be able to help them because they're just, that's a habit. That's a broke person's habit. So the key is to develop wealthy people's habits. Kind of like you said, you said something about, um, I have the wealth, I possess it even though it just hasn't shown up yet. It's that idea. If someone lives below their means and they invest 10 to 20% of their income for their future, they're wealthy. It just hasn't shown up in their life yet. So if someone is doing that, then there's some great ways we can make it more efficient and really polish it up for them. Um, But I would say for people to ask, uh, make sure that they understand what their advisors is doing. I meet a lot of people and I just ask them, hey, just explain to me in simple terms, what is your investment strategy right now? And nine times out of 10 people can't really, they can't put words to it. And when you hear that, when they can't put words to it, what goes through your mind? I say, well, selfishly, I say good, because that means I'm going to have an opportunity right. to serve this person. But I'm thinking, well, you have a problem. Because if you don't understand what your strategy is, then you're just going on blind faith, really, that this person's going to be doing the best thing for you. And that's not a good... I mean, it's, you need to trust someone. You have to trust your financial person. At the same time, there needs to be some level of it. at least, um, I heard a great quote today from a mentor and he said, um, the test of intelligence is whether you someone can explain something in a way that a third grader could understand. Thank it. you. Yeah. Um, do you know how come I, I said the whole, I sell money for a living? Tell Make me. it as simple as possible because mm-hmm. banking is very complicated on purpose. That's what I've learned. Getting into banking, it's complicated on purpose. So that way people don't understand. And to me, I encourage people, ask me as many questions as you want. I'm your advisor. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a difference. I love what you said. You're like, I'm an advisor. I can't do it for you. You know, and that's where personal discipline comes in and having the tough conversations. So is your team built on having tough conversations with clients when they share their goals and they're like, hey, you got to do the work. You know, do you, do you, do you experience that in your industry? Oh yeah. I mean, people will do very irrational things with their money. I mean, I'm sure you've seen it too. So I'll meet the, and it's not about intelligence. Not um, at all. I'm convinced that as human beings, we're hardwired to fail with managing our own money. If we do it on our own. How come elaborate on that? How come we're, we're programmed to fail? Part of it. it well, it's because we're driven by emotions when we make our decisions And the two primary emotions are fear and greed or FOMO. And if we see somebody, if we see our friend getting rich, and I won't, I know there's people that um, love crypto. I won't talk about crypto because that's its whole world on its own. Um, But when did most people buy Bitcoin? When after it went up like from 10,000 to like 55,000. They bought it when it was at 55 and then it crashed and then they sold. So they waited. Once they saw everybody else making money, that's when they invested. That's FOMO. That's one reason we blow ourselves up because it's painful for us to see our friends get rich and we feel like we're missing out. And the other one's fear. So there was, there was actually $1 trillion of money that was moved out of stock funds into money market funds in March of 2020 by individual investors. Those they were afraid, which is understandable. Right. 
that was the wrong decision though, because now they never, they didn't make money when it recovered so fast, yep. they didn't participate in that and they locked in all those losses. So it's really because we're, we're driven by those, those emotions. I, I love that you're talking about emotion, you know, and emotion leads to irrational decisions. Majority of the time from what I've seen, because you, you have to allow money to do its thing. Mm hmm. You have to allow money to do its thing. And the n numbers in history don't lie. You know, yes. it all comes to fruition, unless something catastrophic happens and, and it does. But even still, there's always that recovery. How many people are prepared for retirement in the US right now? It's not what it should be. I want to go back. I, I, yeah. There was something um, you said. I think it's important that I, I look at myself as a financial doctor for people. Ooh, so it's okay. kind of like if someone came into the doctor and they said, hey, I, I want to live a long time, but I just really love smoking a pack of cigarettes every day. I, I don't want to give that up, but tell me, help me live to a hundred without giving that up. The doctor's going to say, I can't help you. You no got to stop smoking cigarettes. Um, my, my prescription for you is stop smoking cigarettes, eat right, exercise, have a nice day. And the doctor's not going to care. The doctor's not going to get depressed I mean, maybe they will. Um, if the person doesn't stop smoking cigarettes, they're just going to tell them what to do. Or if the person comes in with a heart problem, the doctor's going to say, you have a heart problem, Ollie. I need you to see this specialist. We're, we're going to need to get you in for surgery in about two weeks. My secretary is going to call you to set up the appointment and, and, and she'll discuss the next step with you. I'll see you in two weeks. And then they leave. They don't care if you follow through or not. They're just going to tell you what the right course of action is going to be. So I I really work to adopt that with my clients and tell them, hey, the current path you're on is going to lead to failure for you. If you keep doing what you're doing, it's going to result in you not having enough money or your, your children not enjoying the lifestyle that you want to lead for them. If you want to fix that, here's what you can do, A, B, and C. This is what we need to do. Would you like to move forward or not? And it's just really, I just like to be, I take myself out of it where at the very beginning of my career, I didn't think that way. And I really got my feelings hurt if they didn't follow my recommendations. And then I realized I can't control what anybody yeah. does. Um, everyone's living their own life. All I can do is tell them the truth. Um, I work with a lot of people now that they're on pretty good in pretty good shape. And so I get to tell them the good news. But if someone does have a problem, I'm just going to tell them, hey, you have a problem. And this problem is going to cost you X amount of dollars if you don't fix it. Here's how. Here's a pathway for you to fix it. Would you like to do that? And David, you know what I gravitate towards by you being so transparent is like you're upfront. Like you know, if you think that there's a magic solution for fixing your finances, there isn't. Yeah, got to do the work, and that's what I've realized. It's like before we you were. I think we were talking about ego, and I thought to myself, I'm like, okay, all these people are you know are achieving success and doing this and all that. That's fine. It's all about the action. You could think and do all the stuff that you want, but bottom line, as long as you have that belief and you do the work and you have the core values, you're going to win. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of time to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's why when I meet people like yourself, like there's no doubt your team is going to be successful. Look at who's leading them. You know, you. the right doing the right things for the right reasons. With your reviews, I would say you're consistently getting a lot of five-star experience reviews. That's true. Yeah. We get most, almost 95% of our business is referrals from existing yeah. clients. Of course it is. How did I know that? Because I, I see the person that's leading the charge and those, those values, those ideas, the problem solving is being taught and you're expanding that sphere. I mean, those are, see, that's why I advocate for individuals like yourselves, you know, because you do right by people, you treat people right, you give them the right information and don't tell them what they wanna hear. Like that to me is people doing their fiduciary responsibility. Yes. And I love what you said about the doctor. I'm a financial doctor. That's hot. <laughs> That's, hot. That's good. That's good. Um, what, what else do we need to know about you when it comes to like your business and what you wanna accomplish over the next five years? Like where are we heading with, with our financial market. What do you, what do you see happening? Oh, actually I did want to touch on something. You yeah. talked about opportunity. Oh, this is good. What do you think about this? When you realize opportunity happens, it's already too late. I, th well, I think it's so true because especially in the investment world, right? That if you don't have a plan in place 
to, if you wait till something happens to create a plan, it's going to be too late because by the time you execute on it, the, op- the window is probably closed. So, so what advice do you give to people in regards to recognizing, like, what is the opportunity in your expert opinion to come over the next like 12 to 24 months? Cause we're just, you know, with inflation and recession soon to come, there's going to be a lot of opportunities yes. that are going to come about as you got a big grin on your face. <laughs> Talk For about sure. that. Yeah, I would say uh, it's really the opportunities to have a financial plan. I meet so many people out there that they're looking at their finances in a silo. They're looking at their, they've got a CPA, they've got a an investment person, maybe they've got an estate plan, but there's never been anyone that's wrapped their arms around the whole thing and said, hey, here's where some, you've got some good tax ideas here, but these other things are sort of negating those good ideas. We need to, we need to really integrate all these ideas together. So, because the one thing about the the investment world, you're, you're 100% right, there's going to be an election Um, interest rates just went up faster than they've ever gone up in history. Um, We had the worst year ever for a a balanced portfolio of investments. 2022 was the worst year ever um, because bonds and stocks both went down that year. So uh, I believe there's going to be a lot more volatility in the, in the near future um, as this sort of reckoning of these higher interest rates works its way through the economy and the people that have a plan are going to be positioned to thrive through that. And they'll, there are strategies that I'd be, you know, that we probably don't have time to get into now, but there are strategies to make more money when there are drops. Uh, there's tax strategies, there's audit, kind of automatic uh, rebalancing strategies, which can make more money when there are drops. And people that are planning are going to win. And people that are, that don't have a financial plan are not going to do as well, is my yeah. opinion. I've um, <clears throat> just getting into this space. I, I, I started in this world in 2019 and I've just been shocked at how many people don't have fiduciary advisors around them. Mm-hmm. Because here's what I've learned. If you surround yourself with smart people that really, really care about other people and their advisors in their space, they will create a lot more uh a lot more freedom for you. It's not about money. They will create a lot more freedom and money for you by the advice that they give you. And it's a win-win. Mm-hmm. Would you agree with that? Like some of the smartest people that you pay really, really well are going to create the most income for you. It's crazy. Absolutely crazy it. to me. I'm like, so now I don't, I don't sweat it. I'm like, you got to spend money on the right things with the right people and you got to have the trust and likability. So how would you go, why don't you give us some advice on how to pick the right wealth advisor for their respective families? Yeah, I would say uh, asking them a few questions. One would be explain your investment philosophy to me. Mm, Okay. And see if they can do that in a way that you understand. Uh, I would say number two would be, what are the tax strategies that we're going to be using together and see if they, if they sort of look like a deer in the headlights, uh, which most advisors probably will, that's a problem. Okay. Um, this is great. Yeah. And then the third one would be, uh, what's just, what's your planning philosophy? How should we go? How should we build a financial plan? What are the steps I need to take? I have a, I have a four point wealth building platform for my clients that we go through with everybody that makes sure we we look at all areas of their financial plan. So I would I would say those three questions are a good place to start. I, I, I love those. And how are you going to get that message out uh, as you grow the team? How are you going to get that message out to the community? What, what's your branding of marketing strategy? Yeah, I mean, we're, we are... Um, there's a there's so much compliance in our industry. It's tough, especially I work for with a great company. Northwestern Mutual is a great partner. They are they have nine thousand advisors, so they sort of have to manage to the lowest common denominator in terms of what they allow us to do for things like this. So um, I don't have visions of necessarily doing like a big podcast, which although that could be really great. Um, but my vision is really, I do some seminars. So I do teach at, uh, retirement planning seminars at uh, San Diego State University and um, at Miracosta College. So if anyone's interested in that, um, they can come. It's really, it's uh, really helpful. Come join me. I'm going to go see David in action. 
uh, I do that. Uh, that's, and then normal, uh, just word of mouth. That's the main strategy. Okay. I love the events. Talk to me about that. How'd you get into the San Diego State and Miracosa? What did you do to make that happen? Yeah, so uh, it's with a, a marketing firm that that actually sends mailers out to get people to come, and uh, they it's a retirement planning. So it's for people to get ready for retirement planning and all the eight different steps and and areas they need to be thinking about. Um, and then I've, I've built a curriculum. It's kind of like a class. I'm kind of like the professor up there and which, which is fun for me. I do love teaching and I get to educate and help and share these ideas with people for about, uh, for two hour, uh, classes. How, how long have you been doing this? For about four years now. Okay. I'm going to be one of your biggest advocates. I, I'm, Thank a, you. I'm a huge fan of this. So I was going to ask you if you actually did live events. Yeah. Because live events, like I think these seminars, um, the hardest thing I've learned is I do care. I, I'm What sets me apart is I do care about every family that I serve. Like it mm -hmm. means a lot. Like their goals become my goals and I'm passionate about it. Um, and there's that little emotion, not a little, it's actually a lot of emotion. So it's hard to force someone to take that first step and yes. to be financially literate to achieve financial freedom, you have to take those steps. You have to go to the seminars. And I say have to, if you really want change to happen, you have to take the steps of change. Yes. What do you think about that? I think that's it. And and I tell people in the classes that there's, there's two types of retirees. There's people that are willing to invest in themselves and invest in their education. And there's people that aren't. And the people that are willing to invest and take proactive steps are going to be the ones with more happiness, more peace of mind, and with less stress in their life. So I, I 100% think that that's the way it works. So I'm in my, I'm, I'm watching you right now on the podcast. I'm 40 years old. I don't really have a retirement plan. There's no way I'm going to have the cash flow that I need every single month to live the life that I want to live. Where would you recommend I start? I would say we're happy to, I, I would be happy to offer a complimentary session, um, goal finding, goal setting session with anybody who's listening to this. So you guys, you guys do that. Yeah. And that's where everything begins is you really connect with people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love your approach to, to the finance world, you know, and you. are you doing anything with like youth? You know, I've, I've done a little bit, uh, with my, my time is so limited right, right. now with two kids. <laughs> so basically you don't have a lot of extra, <laughs> I would love to do that at some point. Uh, there's a lot of things I'd love to do. I'm just haven't really, I'm kind of at some level, I, I'm a planner. Um, but some level I'm kind of just trying to yeah. survive the, the period with a new, almost a newborn still. Uh, so that's, that's the main focus. Yeah. Um, I have a wild idea for you. So these, uh, seminars that you're doing in Miracosta and San Diego state have them bring their kids. It's actually that's really cool. Idea. Like teenagers, yeah. because that's what I've been doing. Like David, I've, I've thought about this. I'm like, uh, being a parent is the hardest thing I do every day. Yes. Holy moly. And now I'm, we, ha I have three boys that are going to enter the world very soon as adults. I'm like, okay, got, got some work ahead of me. Let's rock and roll. So I just appreciate, uh, that you're putting on these events mm -hmm. to actually go out there and make an impact. And in that I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. So we'll definitely talk about that. Any, uh, um, uh, any final thoughts before we wrap up? I would just say if, you know, if you, if you don't, uh, if you fail to plan, then you can plan to fail. So especially as the, the year's rolling over, 2024 is getting going, it's a great time to to create a financial plan, create more peace of mind and confidence. And uh, and it's not a painful process to go through it as much as a lot of people might think. Yeah. And when you have the right people on your corner, it's that much easier. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, you know, David, what I appreciate is you gave... Uh, you know, all our viewers, all the audience, an opportunity to be able to connect with you. And that's what it's all about is like, you know, how easy is it going to be for someone to watch this, be able to call you up and say, David, this is where I'm at, man. Like th that, that being real and giving people an opportunity to connect, it means everything. Who would you love to thank? Who makes your day brighter? Who, who allows you to be the best version of you every day? Here's your your chance to thank some people. Yeah, I'd like to thank, thank Shane Lupo for connecting us and thank you 
for uh, having me on on this great podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, and then thank my wife. Uh, she's does a great job with our kids. She stays at home with them, and and she's a great partner. Noel, I love you. Um, and then uh, I mean, there's some my family, my team. My team's phenomenal. They would really go bend over backwards to take care of our clients. And I couldn't, I couldn't be more lucky uh, with the team that I have. And, and thanks to, to all my clients who let me do what I love to do uh, every single day. And I think we're all lucky to know you as well. So thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate it.